تلجيم Get started. Okay, gang, let's get started. Welcome back from spring break. Hope you had a good one. So, uh, the agenda for today is I'm gonna lecture for about an hour and then you will get your midterms back today. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm gonna set aside the last 15 minutes of the period for uh, Vineet to pass back your exams in a somewhat orderly fashion. So, um, and he may have some things to say about the, uh, how the grades came out and so forth. So, so you have that to look forward to. Uh, but before we get there, we're going to talk about solar power, the first of several segments on electricity from renewable resources that we'll be reviewing. Uh, a reminder that your next homework set is due on Thursday before class. This is homework set five, first one that I assigned to you. And so uh, I will have office hours, as I mentioned in my announcement online. I'll have office hours tomorrow from 3 to 4 p.m., if you have any last minute questions on that homework set. Okay? So, uh, it's been a while since we saw each other, um, but when we last met, <clears throat> we were talking about uh, fossil fuels and combustion reactions that are used to produce heat to drive uh, power plants to make electricity using things like the Rankine power cycle. There was some uh, material at the end of that lecture unit talking about alternatives to petroleum, uh, which I'm going to set aside. I'm going to cover that on my last lecture in this course, which will be a week from Thursday when we cover the unit on energy for personal mobility. That would be um, an appropriate time for us to get into the subject of, you know, what are we going to do when we get past peak oil? What are going to be the liquid fuels of the future to power our automobiles? So, so we'll come back, we'll circle back to those slides the ones we didn't cover in the last unit um, you know, next week. But for now, I want to move along and talk about uh, getting electricity from renewable resources, starting with solar. So uh, your quote of the day comes from Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, it takes as much energy to wish as it does to plan. So good words to live by. Uh, in this lecture unit, we're going to introduce the energy utilization concepts of capacity factor and efficiency. And so these are two related but distinct measures that tell us uh, how effectively we utilize an energy source and how effectively we utilize the equipment that we put into place to exploit that resource. Okay. Ideally, we're both high measures. We're, do both doing, we're doing both of those things. Uh, but we'll find with some energy sources, we can't always have both. We have to choose one or the other. What else are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to cover um, two different ways of making electricity from sunlight. 
Uh, one is using solar collectors to run a, a solar thermal plant, which is a heat engine. Uh, the other would be to use photovoltaics. And so to understand what a pho photovoltaic array does, you need to understand a little bit of the physics there. So I'll, I'll say a few things about how a photovoltaic device actually produces electricity from sunlight. And we'll go over the options for directly converting solar energy into work. So that's the agenda. Uh, I showed you this slide before. It's a flow chart describing how energy gets the Earth's surface and you know, the, the income sources of energy. And the vast majority of it, remember, comes from the sun. So you know, the next few units, we'll talk about how we directly or indirectly utilize the sun's energy to, to produce electricity from these renewable sources as opposed to the inheritance-based solar income which would be that fossil fuel category down there at the bottom, right? So when we're talking about solar flow of energy, we have the direct insulation from the sun, its irradiance. We also have the indirect delivery of energy through the sun's action on the hydrologic cycle, which produces water at elevation for hydroelectricity. It, it gives us um, other sources of water for use in power generation, including things like um, geothermal energy. Uh, the sun drives the atmospheric wind, right? And so wind power comes indirectly from the sun. It also derives, drives photosynthesis. So biomass derived electricity would be another, um, you know, arm's length version of solar energy. So today we'll focus directly on, you know, harnessing sunlight that gets to Earth's surface and what we can do with it. So solar energy, like other forms of renewable energy, they have a few distinguishing features that are worth mentioning. One is that unlike um, reserves of coal or uranium or natural gas, you know, they're available throughout the world for the most part. Right? So uh, regardless of political boundaries, there's, there's sunlight right? and there's, there's wind. And, 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 and so these are resources that um, are available potentially to all nations develop, developing and so forth. Uh, Another important feature which we, we touched upon already is that uh, unlike fossil fuels, uh, the, the energy fluxes that come from these renewable sources are a lot lower. So uh, the, the power that we can capture per, per unit surface area is much smaller for solar and for wind and hydro and so on than it is for coal-fired power plants or, or a gas combustion turbine. Uh, so that's you know, something we have to work around. We have, as I mentioned in the first couple of lectures, we have a society that uses technologies and uses devices, engines, machines that uh, deliver a lot of power in a small space, but that requires fuels that have high energy density. And so one of the major tasks with renewables is how do we get to, um, from low to higher power densities or, or, or energy densities to supply these, these uh, devices that produce electricity from sunlight? or from wind. That's a major problem we have to solve. Another problem we have to solve with renewables is that they have an intermittency issue. What does intermittent mean? Not constant, yeah. Uh, sporadic, right? So uh, they're not what we call dispatchable resources. We can't order the wind to blow or the sun to shine, right? Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. So, if you're a utility operator and you have a power demand to meet uh, based on consumption out there and you have to spin up resources to meet the need for any given moment, the wind may be or may not be available. Uh, maybe a cloudy day, maybe a sunny day. You can't be positive what your generation will be from, from some of these renewable energy sources. So uh, the intermittency means that uh, we have to contingency plan, right? We still may need a gas turbine as a backup in case we go through a period of where the winds are idle or where you know, the solar resource potential is not that good. Um, so intermittency also means that we might think about energy storage. In other words, set aside energy that we capture from, from sunlight or from wind or from hydro and use it later on when the demand is higher, maybe when we, we have a pressing need for it. So we'll talk about that a little bit next week. Uh, 
renewable resources, currently the capital cost of investment per unit of power output is it's higher than it is for some of the other energy sources that we've been accustomed to using over the past few decades. And so there are downward drivers on those costs, but they still sit above where fossil fuels are at in generation of electricity using coal and gas. And so that means they have to be propped up if, uh, if they're going to be used right now, right? They have to be subsidized. So when you talk about wind and solar, it, it gets you into the politics of it as well. And I'm going to studiously avoid most of that because I'm here as an engineer to talk about technology with you and sustainability. But there are certainly lots of classes you can take on campus if you have an interest in that area that focus on the policy side of the you know, renewables uh, and, you know, and, and what governments can do and what they shouldn't be doing to, to affect those markets. So uh, if we look at how renewables stack up against conventional energy sources, this is a chart I made reference to, you can see that uh, you know, in the case of, of uh, fossil fuels and nuclear fissile fuels, high energy fluxes, hundreds of thousands of watts per square meter. For wind and solar, the fluxes are a full factor of 10,000 smaller. So per unit area, the, the energy intensity is a lot lower. So part of the solar game is figuring out how to concentrate that energy to make, make it uh, intense enough to do something worthwhile with. You know. And you can see the cost over there. Uh, for the most part, the renewables cost a lot more per watt hour generation than do uh, you know, electricity derived from uh, cheap sources such as coal or natural gas or, or nuclear. Uh, we're starting to see some competitiveness with wind in the right situation. High category winds in the upper Midwest that have short transmission distances to markets can be nearly competitive, almost in parity with some of the fossil fuel generation types. Wouldn't say we're there as a sector-wide industry, but wind is starting to, to gain some traction. Uh, if we were to live in a future world where carbon was constrained, where you had to you're mandated to capture and store CO2 emissions from burning coal or gas. You can see that would uh, also level the flame, playing field somewhat, although there's still a lot of separation between some of these technologies and things like solar, solar power. So it uh, gives you a lay of the land there. Some of the other sources we'll talk about next week involving tidal energy or geothermal or ocean thermal have even lower energy densities as a starting point. And so, again, there's an even greater distance to cover to, to do something useful with those. So these figures of merit. Uh, so if we, if we measure the performance of a plant, of a power plant or a device and its ability to harness an energy source to produce electricity, uh, there's two important measures you need to know about. One is the effectiveness. And we've already seen an aspect of effectiveness with our discussions of fossil generation where we talk about a conversion efficiency of taking, um, you know, the heat, uh, the, the chemical content of coal, its heating value, and converting it to electricity. And if we consider the, you know, the broader sequence of events that involve the conversion of the energy content of coal to electricity involving the generator and the transportation to the plant side and the, and the preparation of the coal or, or the pulverization and and all the other energy losses that come along the way, uh, we, we can get a, that figure of merit and overall effectiveness for the entire process of extracting electricity from that energy source. And so we can apply the same version of effectiveness to, to other types of um, generation sources, including those that come from the renewable portfolio. Okay. So what fraction of energy in a source can be effectively collected and delivered by a system? So that's one measure of of a, of a figure of merit. Another one that's important is what we call the capacity factor. And this, as you can read, is a long-term average power output relative to a rated or maximum power output. So when we, uh, you know, if we build a coal power plant, we're going to install a generator to hook up to that turbine. Uh, and the turbine, the generator will be rated for a certain amount of power output. It have a maximum amount when it's going full bore that it can produce with its arrangement of magnets with the rotor and the stator. Uh, now, whether it, it achieves that output depends on the rest of the plant, you know, 
the steam throughput rate in the turbine, right? How much we're stoking the coal boiler, how much coal we're burning to produce the heat, all the other elements, right? And so uh, it represents the maximum, but there may be periods of operation when the coal plant is only achieving a fraction of its rated output, okay? When the generator is not running at full capacity to making electricity. That same sort of measure applies to other types of power generation. Uh, if we build a wind farm, we're going to put this, a similar type of generator in the nacelle of the wind turbine, and we'll talk about this on Thursday. So that generator is rated, generator is rated for a certain output, but it will only achieve that if the winds are blowing robustly, right? If we're getting, it's at its rated wind speed and its maximum power output. If, if we have idle winds or gentle breezes instead of full, full, full bore winds, then uh, again, the capacity will be, will fall short of the maximum. The capacity factor will be less than one. So capacity and effectiveness are two ways we talk about the performance of a power generation system. Uh, some example numbers for capacity factors and effectiveness. Uh, for a, a coal-fired plant, a large, maybe half a gigawatt plant used for baseload power generation, um, those will tend to run almost around the clock. Once they're built, and they cost a lot to build, but once they're built, compared to other types of generation, they're fairly cheap to operate, because coal historically has been a relatively cheap fuel compared to, say, petroleum or natural gas. Um, we've already seen in some example problems we, we did before the break that the, the, the thermal efficiency, you know, the, the effectiveness of a coal plant, only about a third of the energy we get from burning the coal gets converted to electricity. The other two-thirds gets returned to the environment from heat that's exchanged in the, in the condenser unit, right? It goes back to a, a lake or a river. We don't get useful work output from that. And so, so um, a, a coal plant or a gas combustion turbine will typically have effectiveness factors on the wrong side of a half. You know, it'll be like 30%, 35%, something like that, maybe 40% if you do a combined cycle power plant with, with natural gas. Um, so a gas turbine, uh, in addition to having a fairly low effectiveness, it, they typically have lower capacity factors than, than a coal plant. And that's because uh, if you use a more expensive fuel to make electricity, you'll tend not to choose that fuel and that power system over one that has a cheap fuel uh, because you pay more to produce electricity, and so you'd have to charge more to recover your cost, and consumers tend not to like that, right? They want to get things as cheaply as possible, as quickly as possible. But if it's a hot day in the middle of the summer and everybody's got their air conditioners running full bore, you know, full blast, and we have to get electri extra electricity on the grid, uh, we can fire up these gas turbines and produce an extra power and run them on occasion. And so a gas turbine might be what we call a peaking asset, where we only operate it when, when the demand is really high. We keep it on reserve, spin it up when needed. Otherwise, we just set it aside and run on the cheaper baseload coal generation or other baseload resources like a large nuclear plant. Uh, ideally, we would like both those numbers to be high. In the case of, of renewables, like wind and solar, the capacity factors tend to be low, though. Not by choice, again, but, and not even because we chose. Unlike coal and gas, we don't get to choose, as I said, you know, when we have wind uh, high wind speeds, right, or lots of sunshine, okay, that's acts of nature. So, so uh, there's an intermittency issue with, with uh, renewables that tend to suppress their capacity factors. Uh, so let's focus on solar and how we go about making power from solar energy. There are two main pathways to get from photons to electrons, right? So the, the irradiance that comes from the sun arrives at ground surface here on Earth uh, we could try to, to exploit it in two different ways if we want to make electric power. One would be to use that heat from the sunlight and to concentrate it enough to produce steam or some other type of uh, high enthalpy fluid that could drive a power plant, could run a turbine. So in other words, using the same approach that we did with uh, coal-fired power plants, right, except using, uh, you know, the sun's energy as the, the energy source uh, instead of uh, a fossil fuel. So that's the solar thermal conversion route that you see on the left. And that uh, involves 
the use of mirrors that can reflect and focus the sun's light on a, on a receiver, a, a point source that collects it. The other alternative is to not use the heat engine methodology, to bypass the conversion from thermal to mechanical to electrical altogether, and to uh, do a direct conversion of sunlight to electricity using photovoltaic materials. Okay. And so uh, that's based on quantum mechanical principles of certain types of materials known as semiconductors, such as silicon. So we'll explain that process in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Um, so step one, regardless of which one of these paths we decide to go down, we need to first assess how much sunlight or how much insulation is available. And insulation stands for incident solar radiation. Uh, what does that depend on? Well, different things. Some of these you could think of, we just took a moment. It obviously depends where you're at on the Earth's surface, right? What's your geographic location? It depends what time of, time of year it is, right? And what time of day it is. Um, the local weather conditions and, you know, the broader climate of the region, how cloudy it tends to be or how sunny, makes a difference in terms of a site assessment. Uh, getting down to specifics, then, if you, if you build the, the solar collection system, whether you're using mirrors or photovoltaic cells, you'd have to take into account any potential obstructions that would cast a shadow over your, over your array, right, which would obviously impede uh, your task. So, so these are all factors, um, but everything starts with the sun, okay? The sun, what is it? It's a star which derives its energy by doing what? The big ball of what? Hydrogen, yeah. So in the core of the sun, we have a fusion process going on, thermonuclear fusion. It's a gigantic reactor a million miles across, give or take. The core of the sun is at about 15 million degrees Kelvin, and you need those temperatures in order to fuse hydrogen to form helium and release the energy stored in, in those atoms. Uh, the outer surface of the sun, what we call the photosphere, the part that we actually see, is a lot cooler, and I wouldn't call it low temperature, it's almost 6,000 degrees Kelvin, it's still pretty hot, but, but it's considerably colder than the uh, core, right? It's, um, so. The energy is released by fusion deep within the sun, but it actually takes uh, a very long time by convection across a number of layers of the sun's interior structure to get out to the surface, to the photosphere, the shiny part, if you will, where the radiative transfer out into space occurs, okay, and to include the Earth. So the total amount of energy given off by that photosphere is a pretty staggeringly big number on the order of 10 to the power 20 megawatts. So we talked about the biggest plants that we build on Earth uh, to make electricity from coal or nuclear hydroelectricity being, you know, a few gigawatts, right? So this has got that beat by many orders of magnitude. How much of that gets to Earth? Well, as the Earth moves around in its orbit around the sun, its, its face sweeps out a tiny amount of that energy, something on the order of 10 to the 11, but that's still an enormous amount of energy compared to terrestrial generation, right, the sources on Earth. So, uh, so that's the total amount that gets to Earth. If we ask, well, the energy would be delivered across different uh, wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. So what's the mix of energy? Some of it is visible light, some of it is infrared, right? longer wavelengths. Some of it is ultraviolet, you know, higher energy than the visible light. Kind of have to wear sunscreen to stay out of trouble from, right? So there's a law called Stefan Boltzmann, which uh, gives an equation which describes uh, the intensity of the different level, uh, wavelengths of light emitted by a black body. So a black body would be a it's what they call in physics an object which absorbs all the energy it receives and emits across the full range of the spectrum based on its temperature. And so um, here you see a plot of what the um, Earth energy spectrum, emission spectrum looks like, assuming that the Earth is a black body at 288 degrees Kelvin, which is 15 Celsius, average surface temperature on planet Earth. 
And you see that, so there's a range of different um, wavelengths emitted, a continuous spectrum, you know, from the low end, which would be the, the high energy ran, range, right, the ultraviolet, and to the left of that is X-rays and gamma rays, not too much of that here. But then on the long end, going out to tens of microns would be the, the infrared and the far infrared, the lower energy stuff. And if you, if you go way out, you get into microwaves and radio waves, really low energy stuff. And then there in the middle, um, uh, toward the, you know, in the, in the tenths of a nanometer would be the visible light range from 0.4 to 0.7 microns. Those are the wavelengths of the red, the violet color spectrum. So you see for, um, uh, there's, there's an equation describing the emission intensity as a function of the wavelength and, and temperature of the, of the object. And you see there's also a peak. And that peak, uh, roughly speaking, if you take 2900 and divide by the temperature of the object in degrees Kelvin, that tells you the wavelength at which the light emits with the highest intensity. And so for Earth, um, if you divide that by 288, you get, you get about 10 microns, a little over 10 microns. So Earth emits most of its energy to its surroundings as infrared, infrared radiation, right? And you've heard about the global climate change and the greenhouse gas effect. Uh, that involves how much of the Earth's infrared radiation gets back into space and how much of it is trapped and stays local. Right? That's all happening in the infrared band. Uh, the total area under that curve, if we integrate the area under that curve, uh, we get that the total intensity of the irradiance scales as the fourth power of temperature. So there's a power law that says the amount of energy emitted by a black body is, is, is uh, proportional to the fourth power of its absolute temperature. Okay. So that's why the sun, being at a much higher temperature, emits a much, much larger amount of energy than the Earth. Uh, the sun also, because it is um, at almost 6,000 degrees Kelvin instead of about 300, its peak wavelength, where it has its highest emission intensity, is at about half a micron, which is squarely in the middle of the visible light spectrum, right, in that yellow range. That's why the sun has that color. So this is the sun's uh, spectrum. You can see the dash line would be the prediction of a 5,800 degree Kelvin black body from the previous slide's equation. And, and the jagged line is the actual emission spectrum, the black body uh, spectrum of the sun as compared to a black body. And it's pretty close. So that equation does a pretty good job of describing the sun's emission profile. What you see is that um, about almost half of the sun's energy emissions are in the visible spectrum, 47%. And most of the rest is in the infrared, the longer wavelength side. Uh, but about 7% is ultraviolet. So between those three spans, that, that's where you get the, the sun's uh, emission profile. Okay. So that spectrum, if you integrate under it, you get that the total emission is about, uh, that reaches the Earth's outer atmosphere is about 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. So that's what we call the extraterrestrial solar flux, uh, the amount of energy right at the top of the Earth's atmosphere. So we can ask them, well, what about at ground level? Uh, this is what the spectrum looks like actually lower down. And what you see is that um, there's some degradation of that emission spectrum. In fact, in some of the wavelengths, uh, they, the, uh, the energy, uh, th 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 those wavelengths don't get, don't get to the surface at all. They get totally absorbed or, or swallowed up. What's happening is that there are gases in the Earth's atmosphere, things like uh, carbon dioxide and, and water vapor, which when the photons strike those molecules, they can excite vibration and other types of motion within the molecules and swallow up those, those photons and the, and the energy they carried, right? So you wind up having um, a spectrum uh, you know, the, in the area under that integral of that curve is going to be less, right? So the total amount of energy available for a solar power system will be less than we would have optimistically predicted if we looked at the spectrum above the Earth's atmosphere coming directly from space, from the sun. So, you know, it's, there's, still, um, there's still good potential to get solar energy out of this electricity, but, uh, but not as much as we'd otherwise predicted. And as you can see that Depending on the conditions, how cloudy or, or clear the sky is, uh, 
the, the profile can vary. Uh, as the sun moves across the sky during the day, the angle of incidence of the sunlight to any location on the surface where we have a collection grid also changes, right? So when the sun is directly overhead at the zenith, beaming straight down, the layer of atmosphere it has to pass through those beams of light is the smallest, right? Whereas when the sun is rising or setting, if it's on the horizon, it's, it's coming at us from a, through a much thicker layer of atmosphere at a glancing angle. And that means there's more distance the light has to travel and more of it gets absorbed by atmospheric constituents. So uh, one effect of the absorption is that it tends to absorb up the higher energy portions like the ultraviolet part and some of the visible light and, and less of the, uh, the lower wavelength or the longer wavelength, lower energy stuff. And so one reason the sun looks orange or red at sunset, gets that ruddy color, is, is because its spectrum shifts to the longer wavelength side because the, the higher energy stuff gets absorbed by the atmosphere before it gets to our, to our eyes. Atmospheric pollution might have something to do with that as well, but that's one of the reasons. So there are other things that affect the amount of insulation available. Um, Earth, as you are probably aware, is not upright with respect to the ecliptic plane and its axis of rotation, but it's tilted. So it's tilted by about 23 and a half degrees, which is why we have seasons, right? That's why we have a summer and a winter. Uh, the sun, um, the distance between Earth and sun also varies a little bit during the season. Uh, there's a perihelion, a closest approach, which is about 5 million kilometers closer into the sun than the aphelion. Perihelion occurs, right now it occurs a couple weeks after the winter solstice. But that changes over geologic time periods when that happens. And there are other things that affect insulation. Um, if you look over the geological record, there are regular periods of ice ages and warming periods on a 100,000 year cycle. It's called the Malkinovich oscillations. And what this is about is that the, um, the different things about the Earth's orbit and its orientation change over time in a regular fashion. Uh, for example, the Earth doesn't orbit the sun in a perfect circular orbit. It's slightly elliptical, as you can see there, right? It's sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's farther apart from the sun. Uh, that eccentricity, the, the, the ellipsoidal character of the orbit changes over time, mostly because of Jupiter, the gas giant, tugging on the Earth, changing its orbit a little bit. There are other things, such as the axis. The, um, uh, the, the Earth's axis wobbles a little bit over periods of thousands of years, and sometimes the axis is tilted a little more downward, sometimes a little more upright. And so when the Earth is tilted a bit more, the summers are hotter and the winters are colder. And, and so th these, these things all add up to an effect that uh, you, you have regular uh, geologic periods where the Earth will be colder on average or warmer due to uh, its planetary motion. And uh, they tend not to be as severe as they could be. Uh, the moon is a stabilizing function on the Earth in terms of keeping its axis from wobbling too much. But there are variations which climatologists are interested in because they're trying to figure out, okay, how much of the current warming period is because of a geological trend, you know, planetary motion and such, location of continents and how they absorb energy in the oceans, and how much of it is because of emissions from, from civilization, right, from human-induced climate change. And so looking back on the past is important to figure out what's in store for us in the future as we have these new forcing terms on carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere. Okay, well, uh, for a practical matter, uh, if we want to choose a location on Earth somewhere and think about doing a solar energy uh, site development, we would have to uh, characterize the, uh, the quality of the sunlight, right, the insulation that's available at that location. And so, um, you know, on any given day, the amount of insulation available depends on where you're located, what line of latitude you're at, right? whether you're in the northern or southern hemisphere. It will depend on what time of year it is, what's the calendar day. Right? Uh, obviously, on a given day in June or July, there's better resource potential than in a, uh, in a winter month, at least in the northern hemisphere, when the day, daylight is shorter. It also depends on the cloud cover at that location on average. 
the weather conditions and how much direct sunlight is available versus sunlight from diffuse or reflected sources. And so uh, there are different ways of cataloging uh, the, the solar resource potential. We talked about for uh, calculations involving coal steam power plants, there are tables that categorize the properties of water, you know, steam calculators or charts or figures or steam tables. Perhaps you used some of those in the last homework set. Uh, same sort of thing applies for solar energy. We have, for example, uh, handbooks that have what are called sun path diagrams. Here's one that shows you what a sun path diagram looks like for uh, a site around the line of latitude where we're located here in Michigan. And so uh, it shows you what, if you're facing south, you know, due south would be the zero degrees on the horizontal axis, what we call the solar azimuth angle. This chart shows you what path the sun would trace as it rose on the western sky, sorry, the rose in the eastern sky, crossed over and set in the western sky over a period of you know, a few hours. And so uh, you see that in the winter months, the sun rises and sets close to the horizon in the summer months, it traces a much broader trajectory and it's, it's overhead for a much longer period of time. And so uh, at a given hour of the day, you know, starting six, seven, eight, noon into the afternoon, you can locate where the sun would be. I should point out these charts, that's not literally 12 o'clock noon at the top, okay? It's what we call solar noon. It would be the time of day at that location on Earth's surface, you know, the, the GPS coordinate of latitude and longitude, when the sun would be directly south, right, at its highest elevation above the horizon. So that might not necessarily be 12 o'clock p.m. It might be 1.15 in the afternoon, it might be 11.20. It all depends on the local conditions and the local geography where you're at. But roughly speaking, this would correspond to what you would see from sunrise to sunset. Right? Uh, and so, a diagram like this might be useful, for example, if you're setting up a grid, a photovoltaic array, and you know, uh, there are some tall trees or buildings on the south-facing horizon, and you want to know uh, what shadowing effect might potentially limit the amount of solar energy you can collect utilizing a particular parcel or plot of land where you want to put the collection system. And so by overlaying um, you know, the height projection of the of the obstruction onto a sun path diagram, you could make a reasonable assessment that, we'll say in the winter months here, December and January and November, um, a good chunk of the day, the, the grid, the, uh, the array will be obstructed from direct sunlight reaching it. Whereas in you know, March and onward, the sun should be passing safely uh, at an altitude above any local uh, ground clutter uh, and, and, and you can proceed apace. So that's one way of representing um, insulation that's available at a given latitude or location. Uh, tables can also be generated. Uh, this is what's called a clear sky insulation table. This just takes into account, again, um, a location and a time of year. And for example, 40 degrees northern latitude in the month of January. So if you have a collector facing to the south at that latitude line at that month of the year, under clear sky conditions, so not worrying about cloud cover and the weather and so forth, uh, but, but just assuming clear skies and the amount of sunlight available based on the known trajectory of the sun in that month. This shows you the amount of um, energy that could be collected on an hourly basis, the, 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 the resource potential at least, in watts per square meter. So you know, at the hour from 9 to 10 a.m., with a um, collector at a tilt angle of 40 degrees relative to ground surface, one could obtain 540 watts per square meter of insulation. Now, how much of that gets converted to electricity depends on the details of the conversion system, but that would be the available resource under clear sky conditions um, for that time. And so the, the numbers at the bottom represent the totals um, in kilowatt hours of energy insulation available per day, right? So, you can see that um, when you're setting up your, your, if it's a photovoltaic array that you're setting up, for example, to capture the insulation, uh, the angle that you tilt it toward, you know, upward toward the horizon uh, makes a difference, right? If you have a tilt angle of zero degrees, if you just lay the panel flat on the ground so it's facing directly upward, uh, you can see for the month of January, you're not going to get a whole lot of insulation, 
versus if you tilt it up at an angle of 40 or 50 degrees, you're doing a lot better. You get you know, double the amount of insulation. And that's because in the winter, in the northern hemisphere, the sun doesn't get very high above the horizon, right? It stays to the south. It doesn't get overhead. And so you'd want to push your collector plate up high enough, tilt it high enough so that it's facing to the south. And the, light, the sun's light is coming at it almost at a right angle that maximizes the amount of energy you could collect. You can do things such as put a tracking system, motorize your collector, so as the sun rose in the east, it would um, follow it across the sky, right? It would, it would be on a, uh, a motor with a, with a timer on it that would track the sun as it um, went, went to the western sky. And by keeping the, the, the panels facing in the direction where the sun's disk is located, you could also, as you can see, improve the amount of energy you can collect. Just look at the numbers at the bottom there. Uh, a one-axis system would just track the sun as it moves from east to west. Uh, a two-axis system would also track the sun as it got higher in the sky and then tracked it as it came back down. So that would be motorized in two different axes. A little more expensive to do that. And you only gain a little bit of extra energy putting that second degree of freedom in there. So typically the one-axis tracking is what most mobile arrays would use because uh, you see the biggest bang for your buck there. But these tables are an example of another resource we can use to look up insulation data for a given prospective uh, solar farm. Uh, and, and one can um, uh, decide what, what you want to do, like what angle you want to use uh, in order to mount the system, if it's at a fixed tilt angle, or whether you want to go to the trouble to do an, uh, a one or two axis tracking system. There are graphical versions of these tables as well. Uh, these types of diagrams are compiled by some of the national laboratories maintained by the Department of Energy, like Sandia and NREL. Uh, this one shows you what's called um, an insulation map that has contours with, you see the numbers on them. Um, they represent um, uh, kilowatt hours per square meter per day of solar radiation. If you have a collector facing southward with a tilt angle which is 15 degrees less than whatever the local latitude is. Right? As you go to further northern latitudes in North America, you'd want to tilt the collector further upward so it faces further south because the sun will be further down uh, at a glancing angle otherwise if you don't. So uh, these numbers, one way to think about them, they correspond to hours of what's called full sun. So the equivalent amount of time each day that the sun on average is shining at you know, full intensity. So you can see um, these charts take into account things just besides the local latitude. Otherwise, they would be the same across um, a horizontal band, right? But you see that uh, in the US, in Arizona, and New, New Mexico, and California, they're 7.5, whereas over here in Michigan, where we're at, it's a little above six hours of full sun per day. So. Uh, what accounts for the difference? Why, why are the uh, hours of full sun the highest there in the American Southwest? Any of you ever been there? Nobody's going to see the Grand Canyon? Wow, these, these poor deprived children. <laughs> Go check it out, it's really nice. Why do old people retire there? It's sunny, yeah, it's sunny and dry. it's a desert. It's a desert, people, right? <laughs> so there's no cloud cover. Well, there's rarely cloud cover, right? So you get more sunlight. It's just, this has to do with the local climate, right? So dry, arid regions tend to be less cloudy and tend to have more sunlight, better solar resource potential, okay? Seriously, go see the Grand Canyon. Uh, okay, well, uh, so that's, uh, some, some tools and data resources to characterize solar energy potential, resource maps and tables. Uh, so let's talk about the technology used to convert that sunlight into electricity. So, so one strategy, as I mentioned, is to do the concentrating solar power approach to run a, uh, a thermal-derived power generation scheme. And, and the idea here is to, uh, uh, to take the sun's energy and to concentrate it high enough temperatures that you get good thermal efficiency with this power plant. 
right, to drive a turbine to make electricity. So you can either do this in a centralized mode or a distributed mode. Uh, here you see a picture of one of the larger concentrating solar power facilities out in Barstow, California, the so-called Solar 2 plant. So that glowing object in the middle is what's called the receiver, and it is receiving, as the name implies, the reflected beams of sunlight from the hundreds of mirrors all concentrically arranged around it. So every one of those mirrors is beaming its rays, as schematically shown there, onto a central point source. And it's glowing because it's white hot. Uh, its temperature is probably about 900 degrees Celsius. Okay. So we will be caught up there <laughs> during operation time. Uh, so here are the, again, uh, out of that almost 1,400 watts per square meter of insulation that gets to the upper atmosphere of the Earth, uh, only uh, a small amount of it, something on the order of 150 to 300 watts per square meters, gets to Earth's surface. Uh, what happened to all the rest? Well, it got lost on the way. Some of it got reflected off of the tops of clouds back into space. Uh, some of it got absorbed by the ozone and the carbon dioxide and water vapor and other gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, some of it gets scattered because it bounced off of aerosol particles or other surfaces. Right? Uh, and the, the scattering leads to what we call a diffuse irradiance, which that could still potentially be useful because it might scatter back in a direction to our collection array. But um, most solar plants have to have a good direct component of radiation, direct beam intensity in order to be economically viable. So let's consider uh, a couple things. First, let's talk about the collector plates. Uh, what, what are the, um, the physics of the, the, the plates we use to, to collect the energy and the concentrate it? And then what, what can we do to further collect it versus just a flat plate? So uh, here's a schematic of what a flat plate collector might look like to utilize solar thermal energy. Uh, what do we got going on here? Well, we have um, um, the, the basic components is there, there's a, uh, a bank of tubes that has a fluid flowing through it, a medium of fluid. Um, and those tubes are resting upon an absorber plate, and that's a plate which is coated with a dark coating with a high absorbance. It might just be as simple as painting it black. And so as the sun's energy beams on that surface and is absorbed, by that dark coating, it um, will heat up the surrounding uh, environment, which would be the fluid medium in the tubes. And so uh, the, the absorber plate is covered by a transparent cover, right? Typically glass. Uh, and uh, so that allows the sun's rays to pass through, but provides protection, right? Uh, and then it's gonna be insulated underneath as well, because typically, we, we don't want to heat up what lies underneath the roof of the building. We just want to transfer as much of that heat as possible into the fluid and get it hot enough to drive a power plant, a turbine. So uh, what fraction of the sun's irradiance I is collected as useful heat in the, in the fluid inside of the, in that flat plate? So that ratio Q over I will be our efficiency, right? Uh, well, it turns out to be equal to the following equation. So there's, a, there's an absorbance which again, we want that number to be as high as possible, right? A high absorbance means that most of the irradiance is transferred into heat when it gets to the absorbing plate. Uh, but from that, we have to subtract off uh, energy that's lost to the surroundings, okay? And so as the fluid in that collector, in the pipes of that collector gets hot, uh, it's gonna get a lot hotter than its surroundings. And so there's gonna be heat transfer loss to the surroundings because uh, of the temperature difference which will arise. And so uh, the amount of heat transferred to the environment is given by uh, the temperature difference between the collector and its surroundings. And it's proportional to what we call a heat transfer coefficient. So if you're in, in chemical engineering or maybe mechanical, you'll, you'll learn more about that in other courses. But the heat transfer coefficient uh, a typical value for it is five watts per square meter per degree Kelvin, okay? Uh, the more the contact area between the collector and the surroundings, the more the heat transfer. So it's proportional to area. And the larger the temperature difference between the collector and its surroundings, the, the more the driving force for heat losses as well, 
Uh, a typical value for the absorbance might be about 80 or 90 percent for a well-designed collector. So uh, if we, you know, if, if, if uh, the, the system uh, is effectively run, that the fluid will, as it passes through these tubes and heats up, it's going to approach a limit where as it collects more and more energy from the sun, uh, from the absorber, uh, the, its temperature will get higher and its heat losses will in proportion get higher. And so you'll reach a limit where the amount of energy absorbed is balanced by the amount of energy uh, radiated back to the surroundings, loss of the surroundings by convective heat transfer. And so that happens when, uh, when Q is zero, when, when we get to a limit where Q equals zero. And if we solve for the equation, the algebraic equation for when Q equals zero, we find that we can calculate a maximum temperature for the collector, the highest possible temperature the fluid in that collector can achieve as a function of the surroundings temperature, which might be, you know, 20 degrees, 25 degrees Celsius, whatever it is outside. And it depends on the absorber's absorbance. It depends on the insulation intensity at ground surface, I. And it depends on this, uh, this heat transfer coefficient. So those are the physical properties that set an upper limit to how hot we can get the source energy to run our solar thermal plant, okay? So that temperature is important. Remember, in terms of a, a heat engine, the Carnot cycle analysis tells us that the, the efficiency increases as the temperature of the source of energy increases. So the higher that temperature, the more power we can produce from this process. Uh, a typical flat plate collector efficiency would be on the order of 30 to 50 percent. If you're, if you're just trying to use this type of a plate for, for solar heating, not to make electricity, but just to, for example, um, collectors like this are used for heating water in outdoor swimming pools. You can pump water up to the rooftop of a building, pass it over these collectors, it gets warm, and then you return it back to the pool. And that's a way to save uh, costs for Boilers with natural gas to, to heat a pool. You can just use sunlight instead. So for, for heating applications, this is a fairly effective way to go. If you take this one step further and use that hot fluid to drive a steam, or, or not steam, or a, any type of a turbine, uh, that efficiency will go down by quite a bit. So one problem here is that with a flat collector, you're, you're somewhat limited by geometry with how high that temperature can get. Uh, so the strategy with uh, concentrating solar power, the concentrating refers to the use of curved mirrors, curved surfaces, which will focus um, diffuse light onto a single point. And here we can push up the solar intensity a lot higher, the insulation value, than if we use a flat surface to collect the sun's rays. And so uh, by using uh, curvature, uh, you can uh, uh, get a higher energy flux on a single point or line source. So here, here's one scheme that uses what's called parabolic troughs, where you have, as you can see, um, uh, a cylindrical surface cutaway that has high reflective mirrors on it, and then there's a, a pipe which runs down the center line of this, you know, the cylindrical mirrors. And so all the beams of, of sunlight will be reflected and focused on that single line source. And as fluid is pumped down that pipe, as it goes from one end to the other, it's going to be heated up through the uh, incidence of the uh, photons. So that's a, a, a trough design. You can also use um, a single focal point with a spherical arrangement of, of mirrors around the focus at the center. Uh, so depending on whether your mirrors are spherical or cylindrical in shape, uh, you get a concentration ratio, which depends on this mirror diameter and the focal length that's chosen. Okay. And you can see uh, for a spherical arrangement, you get a much higher concentration uh, ratio than for a cylindrical. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the parabolic trough with a cylindrical design uh, tends to make better use of land area in terms of stacking them and, and, and efficiently against one another. If you think about that Barstow plant with the circular arrangement of mirrors around the center focal point, um, 
there's going to be some unused areas on the edges there uh, that would be uh, you know, land that's not being committed toward capturing solar energy. With, whereas with a uh, modular design using the cylindrical parabol parabolic trough, uh, you, you have less unused land area. So, so they both have their advantages and disadvantages. But, but the point is either way, you're getting a much higher beam intensity. And therefore, um, when we revisit the heat transfer equations, remember this equation, saying that our effectiveness is going to be equal to, um, you know, the absorbance minus the heat losses of the surroundings. Well, now um, that concentration factor gets put in the denominator, that second term, and makes it a lot smaller so that we can get to a much higher peak temperature when we, again, if we set Q equal to zero and do the math. Uh, now the, um, the highest temperature we can achieve uh, will be a lot higher than it was before with a flat plate collector because of the amplifying effect of this concentration scheme. So concentrating solar power systems will utilize focusing collectors to achieve a, a high energy flux within a single small region, a point or a line source containing the fluid that will drive the steam engine. So there are three major types of concentrating solar power collectors. There's a, a standalone design, which would be a single parabolic dish off on its own, again with a spherical type mirror that would beam up onto that receiver, which is mounted up here on the arm. Um, those are used in remote locations or off the grid. So they would provide relatively small scale amounts of power for just powering a single home or maybe a, a few buildings in an isolated encampment or something. For power generation at scale, you know, if we're talking about making megawatts versus kilowatts of electricity, you would utilize either the central receiver approach like at the bar style facility, the solar two plant, or the parabolic trough design and so uh, those are um, ones that you then could hook up to a grid and produce um, quantities of solar electricity at scales in the megawatt range. So here's a kind of a summary, a table that compares and contrasts these three different types of solar electric furnaces. And you see that um, uh, they differ according to what's that concentration factor you can achieve with the, uh, the, the line configuration of the parabolic trough, you can get a concentration factor of, you know, 30 to 80. If you want to get higher than that up into the hundreds, uh, you would, uh, or the thousands, you would utilize the, the spherical mirror designs, uh, one of the first two types. And you see with, with, with a point source instead of a line source, you do get a higher peak temperature, which prospectively would give you a higher efficiency uh, using the energy captured in that manner to drive a, a power plant. Uh, on the other hand, you know, with, with the central receiver, your, further, your, your mirrors are further set back from the receiver than they tend to be with the parabolic trough. So one of the disadvantages of using the central receiver approach is that the mirrors out on the periphery um, contribute only a marginal amount of additional sunlight focused into the source because of the, the, the pretty large span of distance. You're talking about hundreds of acres of land committed to doing this uh, at scale. And so parabolic trough tends to be the most widely used design, even though you get lower peak temperatures and lower efficiencies because of the, um, the other economies of scale that are achieved. So here's an example of a, kind of a schematic of one of these. You, you have, um, again, the solar field, which has these troughs with uh, fluid being pumped uh, down the channel. Uh, you can easily use water for this generate steam or a non-flammable organic fluid. Um, I mentioned that was a solar two power plant. Uh, the solar one plant, there was a predecessor, it burned to the ground because they used a flammable organic solvent. They liked its heat transfer characteristics, but uh, <laughs> they had themselves a little accident and then that plant went, went up in smoke. So, uh, so the solar field is the boiler, if you will, for this type of a power plant. It replaces the, the coal-fired uh, furnace. And so the other components of this, uh, this, of this heat engine are, are similar to what you've seen before. You know, the, 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 the energy collected drives of, you know, the, the boiling and the superheating of the steam, which operates a turbine, which is connected to a generator for the power output. 
And then you have a condenser system, right? What, whatever energy is not converted into mechanical work uh, in electricity uh, has to be returned to the environment. And so uh, when you're out in the desert, you don't have access to very large supplies of cooling water. So often at solar power plants such as, uh, such as this one, they use um, air-cooled condensing where they use fans to cool down the air and, and the, uh, the, uh, the exhaust from the turbine. Or they might use a, um, a hybrid scheme where they have um, spray cooling towers. So there's different, different aspects. But uh, water, water availability is an important aspect of, of solar generation because, you know, the, again, as I, as I mentioned with the American Southwest and other bright, well illuminated places in the world, they tend to be in dry, cloudless climates. And so uh, you do need water to run this, the, the, the power plant's condenser system. You, you also need water uh, to wash the mirrors, right? Dusty climbs such as out in the desert will, you know, if, if, the, if the mirrors become caked with dirt, uh, they're not going to focus the sunlight very well, right? And so, so there, there are water use requirements that can place uh, restrictions on the, how the scalability of the system. Okay, we'll be talking for about five more minutes, and I'm going to turn over the class to, uh, to, uh, to Vineet for the uh, returning of the exams. Um, let me, uh, if we compare and contrast parabolic troughs to other options, you know, the advantages of the trough design, as I mentioned, is that it's, uh, because of um, the economies of scale, it, it gives you the cheapest and most scalable electricity. Uh, so they built these plants up to a the couple hundred megawatt range. There still isn't any single plant that rivals the scale of, of like a medium-sized coal plant, let alone a, a nuclear plant or a big hydro dam, which can still be quite a bit larger than, than these. Uh, and, and the footprint, the land occupied by these facilities is a lot larger than a fossil generation plant. Uh, but the parabolic troughs, you know, where they work best, that they, they can drive down the price of electricity Still above that you get from fossil generation, but, but getting in the same ballpark, uh, getting, getting in the right neighborhood. Uh, they do suffer by having a low conversion efficiency, though. Right? And, and you need a cooling source, as I mentioned, but either using water, or if you use fans to cool the uh, condenser, you, uh, you have to take some of the electricity you generate and turn it right around the operating fans. And so that's a parasitic power loss we'd just as soon avoid if we could. Uh, and you know, for every 100 megawatts of generation with concentrating solar power, you can figure on using about 500 acres. So not an insubstantial amount of land needed for it. Well, let me say a few things, and then we'll stop, about photovoltaic. Uh, so solar concentrating schemes with mirrors uh, involve refocusing of direct beam radiation direct insulation. Uh, one advantage of photovoltaics as an alternative to making electricity from sunlight is that you can use the diffuse and the reflected beam radiation. Remember I talked about how the amount of insulation at ground surface is a lot less than in the upper atmosphere because of uh, reflection back into the space and s absorption and also scattering off of particles and objects. So if we think about the total amount of energy reaching a surface, say of an array on the ground level, uh, it's a combination of the direct component straight from the sun, uh, as well as the diffuse and reflected components. And adding that all up would give us a total amount of insulation available for a photovoltaic application. And so uh, we have to consider direct as well as single or multiply scattered energy sources in, in, in uh, coming up with a, a total insulation value that would be reflective not of just clear sky conditions, but also conditions where we have cloudy skies or overcast conditions. So uh, at the graduate level, I'd give you an analysis of how we do that and talk about some of the equations, but, but we don't have time for that here in this kind of an overview. So I'll just share with you, you know, here's, here's a table which compares at different lines of latitude uh, the amount of solar intensity on a bright day and in an overcast day uh, with, you know, column one is just the direct beam component, 
column two is the direct plus the diffuse beam component. And you can see that in the upper latitudes, the northern latitudes, that diffuse beam component can become a very substantial fraction of the total amount of available insulation. Okay. Uh, so uh, one potential advantage of a photovoltaic system is it can take advantage of some of that diffuse beam component in a way that um, the uh, concentrating solar power system with, with focusing mirrors is not well equipped for. And so uh, the, the, the photovoltaic resource map uh, that this shows you, you know, the available you know, hours of full sun equivalents that are by, by, you know, on a statewide basis. And, and the, the CSP map look, looks similar. You know, the, the, the southwestern states do, uh, it's driven by the direct beam component to be sure. Uh, but the, the solar resource is higher than what you would predict just from direct beam for places like the Midwest and the, the Northeast because of the, of the amount of available diffuse beam component of energy from sunlight. So um, when we reconvene on Thursday, I will continue our discussion of the solar energy resource by talking a little bit about how photovoltaic cells work. We'll talk about the physics of that and some of the uh, economics involved with photovoltaic systems. And then we'll get into wind energy with whatever available remaining time we have. Okay then, so that concludes today's lecture. So uh, everybody just sit tight and we will figure out how to get these exams back to you. Did you have anything you wanted to post up there? With, did you have any like a grade distribution curve? Or, is that online on C-Tools? Okay, listen up.